As the 1700s changed into the 1800s, there also began to be a change in how many Americans viewed those people who were living on the frontier, who were living out there on the edge of the wilderness. And this is reflected in the uh, slang words for those people. In the 1700s, such people were referred to often as woodsmen or backwoodsmen. And backwoodsmen, that did not uh, have a connotation that was that was positive or complimentary. Buckskins, back settlers, rangers and scouts, and woods runners. By the 1800s, however, you started to see the usage of terms like pioneers, trailblazers, pathfinders, frontiersmen, as though uh, as a as a class. Uh, they were suddenly more respectable somehow than they had been previously. And part of the reason for that is because if you look at both, both sides of the year 1800, there was, a, there was a shift in how the country itself was viewed. Okay, so here's a map of the United States in 1800, the year that Thomas Jefferson was elected president. The red is the actual United States, that is the states. Uh, the blue, light blue areas, that is uh, American possessions that are not states. They are uh, territories. So that, in essence, then, is the frontier. The whole Ohio country that we've talked so much about, that's still the American frontier. And then in the south, um, you've still got some frontier down there in 1800. Now, um, previous to 1800, the areas that were there along the frontier were considered the back part of America, and this red area was the front. That was the front facing the Atlantic Ocean, facing the rest of the world, and the frontier was its back end. So the people who were on the back end um, were not regarded that highly. But after 1800, roughly, it got flipped around like a mirror image, and now all of a sudden the frontier was considered to be the front part of America, a front part that was continuing to move westward. And this can be, uh, this can be demonstrated, can be illustrated in the politics of the time. Uh, mid to late 1790s, you had the development of political parties. You had the... Uh, the Republican Party, also called the Democratic Republican Party, and later just called Democrats, uh, led by Thomas Jefferson, as well as James Madison. Um, Thomas Jefferson's view of America was that it should be continuing to, to, to grow westward, that it should be viewed, uh, the focus of America should be on the interior of the country. Now, the other political party, the Federalists, a party that was founded by uh, Jefferson's political opponent, really, Alexander Hamilton. Now we can see him here. Um, that perspective, the, uh, the states along the coast, that's the front part of America facing out. And uh, there was a, a view toward globalism. Hamilton and the Federalists wanted the United States out onto the Atlantic Ocean, interacting with the European countries and uh, with the rest of the world, with global trade and a global economy. Jefferson basically believed the opposite. He believed that the future of America was not business and industry. It was farming. And farming requires land. More people becoming farmers meant more people getting land, which meant more land was required. Therefore, there has to be constant motion toward the West. And uh, like I said, 1800, Jefferson gets elected president. So he is going to have some say over how things go from that point forward. And that is really when that mirror flip kind of happens. And in particular, during his first term, he, he served two terms as president. During his first term, something specific happened that really sped up 
that whole process. And that was, of course, the Louisiana Purchase. Now, Louisiana had originally been a French colony. At the end of the French and Indian War in 1763, the French had lost Louisiana to Spain, which is a really complicated story. And so Spain was in charge of Louisiana for uh, the next, uh, what, uh, 27, 37 years, up until uh, around 1800, uh, when France uh, reacquired uh, the territory, got it back. Uh, by that point, Napoleon Bonaparte was in charge of France, and uh, Napoleon was having some problems. Uh, Napoleon's problem was that uh, essentially he was at war with basically all the rest of Europe. Uh, because the French, the French Revolution, they had killed their monarch, uh, uh, the king and the queen, and a bunch of nobles, and had set up a uh, uh, monarchless form of government. All the other European countries had monarchs, so they kind of frowned on that. Anyway, uh, a, a long period of warfare. Now, uh, this meant that Napoleon needed money. Thomas Jefferson knew that Napoleon needed money, and he thought this would be a good opportunity to make an offer for the port city of New Orleans, which uh, was a very busy port and would really be a huge addition to the United States. And so he sent uh, some uh, representatives. He sent James Monroe, who would later become the fifth president, Jefferson was the third, and a guy named Robert Livingston sent them to France to meet with Napoleon, and they were authorized to offer up to $10 million for the city of New Orleans. However, Napoleon was in a different frame of mind even than Jefferson thought he was, and that's because around this time, France had lost their big uh, island colony of Saint-Domingue in the Caribbean, uh, which was where they got most of their money from the sugar plantations on that, that colony. And that's the colony that's on the same island, Hispaniola, that Columbus had first set foot. Um, the Spanish controlled one end of the island, the French controlled the others. The French lost control when their slaves organized a rebellion and defeated the French army. They defeated Napoleon's army that was sent to put them down and uh, declared what was formerly Saint-Domingue to be an independent republic, the Republic of Haiti, or Haiti in French. So uh, the point is, um, that was the breadbasket of the Western world for France. Uh, Napoleon could not afford to send another army to try to retake Haiti because he was busy fighting everybody else. Therefore, the whole um, Western Hemisphere possessions of France that, that remained to them, really, all the rest of it put together wasn't worth as much as Haiti was, and Haiti was gone. So therefore, when, uh, when Jefferson's representatives came along, and offered $10 million for New Orleans. Napoleon said, tell you what, make it $15 million and you can have the whole thing, all of Louisiana, which is not the current day state of Louisiana. We're talking about the middle third of what is now the United States, essentially. We'll look at a map in a second. Well, $10 million for a city, $15 million for one third of what's now the U.S. That's obviously a great deal. However, it's uh, one of those uh, situations where Napoleon was like, you know what? I need this money now. I have a war to fight. So take it or leave it. I need an answer soon. They had time to communicate with the president and uh, tell them about Napoleon's counter offer. Now, the problem was that um, in, order, uh, in order to uh, get this whole thing through Congress, it would have taken quite a bit of time because everything takes quite a bit of time to get through Congress. And Napoleon was in a hurry. So Jefferson went ahead and authorized them just to go ahead 
and make the sale <clears throat> or take the uh, uh yeah uh, make make the bargain and uh, give them the 15 million dollars so they did and the united states gained louisiana which like i said that's not the modern day state of louisiana uh, here is the map. It's all that brown area, roughly about the middle third of the uh, the United States, doubling the size of the United States of America overnight. So uh, that is a huge, huge area. Now, one thing to remember about Thomas Jefferson is that he was what is called a strict constructionist which means that he argued, and he was usually arguing against the Federalists, that unless the Constitution specifically gives you authority, gives the president authority to do something, then he can't do it. Now, this argument uh, was caused by the fact that uh, Federalists, like Hamilton, like John Adams, argued that uh, certain things were kind of implied in the Constitution. Like, for example, when it says in the uh, preamble, that the government is supposed to provide for the common defense and uh, uh, promote the general welfare. That means that uh, anything that's in uh, the benefit of public defense and uh, general welfare that the government can do. Anyway, Jefferson said, no, it's got to be in the Constitution or you can't do it. Well, guess what the Constitution doesn't do? Specifically give the president authority to spend that much money and buy stuff without the approval of Congress. Now, nobody was upset that the U.S. had gotten all this land, but it was going to come back to bite Jefferson politically because the next time he said, hey, I'm a strict constructionist, we have to go specifically by the Constitution, uh, then his political opponents, the Federalists, could say, oh yeah, well, what about Louisiana and what about what you did? Uh, so that would kind of uh, lose him some traction. Nonetheless, immediate result is all this land has been gained. Now, the U.S. didn't know very much about what was in that area. France did, because, you know, even though the Spanish had been in charge for a few decades, France had before that been in charge for, what, like 150 years. Uh, and French trappers and merchants had been all through that territory. But there hadn't been uh, really any English people, or later any American people. So uh, Jefferson really had no idea what was out there specifically or exactly. So you buy this whole thing sight unseen. The first thing that you're going to want to do is see the sights. And this led to the establishment of what Jefferson called the Corps of Discovery, which uh, was a small group that was sent westward across the Mississippi to go out into this new land purchased from France, the Louisiana Territory, and basically check it out, see what's out there. Now, uh, here I have some of the, the members listed. There were 33 altogether. Uh, Toussaint Charbonneau and Sacagawea joined along the way. They didn't uh, you know, set out with the group. They were picked up. Uh, so we'll talk about them in a bit. Uh, let's talk about the others, um, including the two co-leaders, Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant William Clark. Uh, so they are the guys in charge. Also, uh, uh, pictured here are York, who is the black guy, we'll talk about him in a moment, and John Coulter, one of the scouts, whom we will also talk about in a little bit. So, uh, Lieutenant William Clark, by the way, was the younger brother of George Rogers Clark. George Rogers Clark was a uh, uh, an American general, in the uh, in the revolution that was basically in charge of the American forces in the West, which the West was what is now the Midwest. So we're talking about the Ohio country, Illinois, and so forth. And he had become quite famous. Uh, his younger brother, Clark, 
will eclipse him with this journey. Um, the Clarks had wound up in the, uh, the relatively newly established state of Kentucky, where they, uh, uh, they did some, uh, some farming and owned slaves. The guy York was actually the slave of William Clark. All right, well, the goals of the Court of Discovery, of course, number one, explore the area. Number two, establish diplomatic relations with the Indian tribes that are out there. And the U.S. government basically had no idea what Indian tribes might be out there because they'd never been out there. Also, establish an American presence in the Pacific Northwest. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And because it's Thomas Jefferson we're talking about, who's president, gather scientific data. His scientific curiosity was piqued. He wanted them to bring back samples of any odd plants they found that they had never seen before. He wanted them to bring back uh, the skins uh, of any animals that they discovered that they had never seen before. And he wanted lots of information about the, the Indian tribes that they were going to encounter. Now, uh, they did encounter uh, several tribes, uh, particularly in the, uh, the Northern Plains area, including the Arikara, Mandan, and Hidatsa, uh, who uh, sometimes uh, those are referred to as the three tribes. Uh, they, uh, for a long time, have been allies of one another. Uh, and Lewis and Clark actually stayed with them for, for a spell. Um, the, uh, those are the groups that are not, um, that are not nomadic uh, pursuers of buffalo, but rather they had sedentary villages and practiced agriculture there along the Missouri River. Um, their clan systems and their forms of diplomacy baffled all the Americans on the Corps of Discovery because it was so different from what they were used to. Uh, but they still they still got along with with those guys. They did have some issues with some of the other tribes, including the Sioux, that led to some tension. Well, here is a map of the expedition, and you can see it breaks into two pieces. They kind of separated at that point. So they start off uh, around St. Louis and head northwest and basically go along the northern plains and make their way to the Pacific Ocean. But wait, you may say, perhaps you have noticed here, Louisiana, the territory that was purchased from France, did not extend to the Pacific Ocean. That whole area in light blue, that was claimed by the British. So why did they keep going all the way to the ocean, Fort Clatsop? Uh, that's because, well, like I said, they wanted to establish a presence. So there was every indication that the Americans and the British weren't quite in agreement over who should control the Oregon Territory. The British technically were the ones that had been there, uh, but the Americans were pretty sure that they might want to make a claim. However, they couldn't make a claim unless there had actually been Americans there, particularly Americans representing the U.S. government. So that's why they went all the way, uh, as far as they did, to the ocean. <clears throat> now, along this, uh, this whole journey, I mentioned that there were, there were some tensions with some tribes, but the, uh, the core only lost one person. One poor guy about halfway into the trip got appendicitis uh, about a thousand miles from a doctor. So that's, that's not a good idea. Uh, did not work out well for him. Uh, some of the other uh, tribes that they met included the Nez, Nez Pierce or Ne Perce en Francais, um, who were uh, a tribe that lived in that blue area there. Um, they weren't that impressed with the Americans because uh, they were trading with the British and doing fine. Uh, and they were situated in an area where they could travel a short distance and be at the coast and fish for salmon or 
uh, travel the other direction and uh, be on the plains and hunt bison. In fact, most of the tribes in the Pacific Northwest were not that impressed with this core and were perfectly content uh, with their relationship with the British. Uh, on the way back, on, on the trip out there, the Corps had problems with the Sioux. On the trip back, they had some problems with the Blackfeet. And you can see on the map where those folks were. Well, let's talk a little bit now about those folks that the Corps picked up along the way. Uh, and that is um, the French-Canadian fur trapper, Pierre uh, Charbonneau who was, uh, um, I'm sorry, Toussaint, Toussaint Charbonneau, who uh, had uh, a young wife named Sacagawea, who had one, uh, who had a young child uh, named Pomp, a little boy, uh, well, an infant named Pomp, and was pregnant with a second child. Sacagawea was Shoshone, at the age of 12, she had been captured by the Hidatsa. Uh, that's one of those tribes that Lewis and Clark stayed with for a while. And uh, then, after being taken by the Hidatsa, she was taken uh, as, as wife by the fur trader, Charbonneau. Uh, so uh, she had been married to Charbonneau for three years at this time, by the time Lewis and Clark come through. She's 16 years old. Uh, Charbonneau was hired as uh, as a scout. He was they didn't really need him as a scout. What they needed was his wife, who was Shoshone, and therefore spoke Shoshone, and uh, they were going to go through the territory of the Shoshone, who were pretty uh, influential and pretty powerful, uh, big force in the region. Now, uh, Sacagawea and Charbonneau. Um, made it all the way to the Pacific Ocean, then came all the way back uh, with, uh, with Lewis and Clark and uh, moved to St. Louis in 1809. And in 1812, Sacagawea actually died of disease, kind of similar to the story of Pocahontas. Uh, died of disease after being exposed to large numbers of white people. Uh, she died. She was only 24 years old. Now, uh, Sacagawea has become a uh, sort of a cultural icon like the aforementioned Pocahontas. And over the years, that has sometimes uh, been presented in some problematic ways like Pocahontas. And I'm thinking in particular, a really good example is a movie from the 1950s called The Far Horizons. That was all about the Lewis and Clark expedition. Uh, Meriwether Lewis was played by Fred McMurray, uh, best known for his role in the TV show My Three Sons and for being the professor in the old Disney movie that discovered Flubber. Not the, uh, not the remake with Robin Williams, the original. And um, uh, William Clark was played by Charlton Heston because I, th I think that they must have had some kind of a, of a contract in place that every historical movie had to have Charlton Heston in it somewhere. Anyway, uh, those were the guys that played Lewis and Clark. Sacagawea is played by Donna Reed. So take a good look at Donna Reed right there. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to this picture in a moment. Uh, this was back in the days when they didn't really try hard, actually didn't try at all, to get Native American actors to play Native American characters. Donna Reed, uh, you, if you've never heard of her, uh, she's probably most famous, most well-known to, uh, to my students, um, as uh, Mrs., uh, Mrs. George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, Mary, Mary Bailey, um, and she had a TV show for for a while. So she was the all American, uh, all American girl, about as white as you could get, really, in the 1950s. Um, here's what happened in that movie, and here's why I'm showing showing this and talking about it. 
when they pick up Charbonneau and Sacagawea along the way in the movie, she is in very dark makeup. Notice that on the left. Very dark. Then, when they return and they take Sacagawea with them to Washington to meet the president, and she's she goes to a fancy ball and she is getting exposed to quote-unquote, civilization. The makeup is lightened considerably. Can you tell that? She's a lot... Well, the farther east she goes, the more civilized she becomes, the whiter she is. And here, let's take a look again at the, uh, uh, the cover of the, uh, the DVD, which was also uh, the, the movie poster. She's every bit as white as the two white guys. So that's just kind of a very subtle way that the producers of this film used to demonstrate that the character was growing less wild and was becoming more civilized by getting literally wider. So, you know, when I said this is problematic, that's what I meant. All right, well... Let's take a look at a couple of the other folks. I mentioned York, the slave, slave of William Clark. Once they uh, set out on their way across the Mississippi River into this huge area with no other English-speaking people for you know hundreds or thousands of miles, uh, they were all in the same boat, and they all had to work together. And over the course of this journey, York was invaluable to the expedition, and essentially, um, he kind of, kind of similar to the, uh, the, the role of Esteban or Estebanito with uh, Cabeza de Vaca back in the 1500s when they were exploring the Southwest. Um, once everyone, kind of this small group, had to work together, um, York had pretty much an equal share in the, uh, in the work and uh, was treated uh, pretty much equally with everyone else until they got back. Then he's just a slave again. Although, he did get this neat statue uh, dedicated to him in Louisville, Kentucky. Now, the other person I wanted to talk about a little bit was John Coulter, uh, who was hired on as a scout. He was a frontiersman. He'd spent most of his life, uh, his adult life, in Virginia. Uh, he was a hunter. He was a tracker, so they thought he would come in particularly handy, and he did. Well, they went all the way out to the Pacific Ocean, and then they turned around and they came back, uh, headed back, but Coulter liked it out there. He liked it out there in the West. He liked it out there in the Rocky Mountains, particularly. So uh, he stayed. He didn't come back with them. He remained and um, worked as a fur trapper. Now, uh, there were, uh, there had long been English fur trappers up in Canada. And there had been French fur trappers that had come down as far as uh, the Rocky Mountains and even farther. Uh, But at this point, he was the only American and the only English-speaking fur trapper in the Rockies. And he was uh, the first of this new group of people Uh, American frontiersmen who would be called mountain men. Mountain men, fur trappers, mostly in the Colorado Rockies, uh, or the Rockies in general, who trapped uh, beaver primarily. And we'll talk more about that whole thing later. But John Coulter, first mountain man. He was the only one out there at first. Within a few years, more Americans made their way out there and started working as, uh, as trappers and hunters. Coulter is known for a couple of different things. First of all, Coulter's Run. Coulter's Run. He was. Uh, this was uh, an incident that happened when Coulter was captured, I think by Blackfeet, uh, captured and forced to run the gauntlet, as it was called. That's where you had to... Uh, uh, it's kind of like, you know, in a square dance when you go down the middle and all the, all the people are there, kind of like in two rows... Uh, It's like that, except they strip you naked, and it's two rows of warriors who are beating you 
with, uh, with, with their weapons. Uh, and then if you get to the end of that, if you get to the end of it, then because they're sporting, they will give you a head start to run and try to get away on foot, naked. And then they'll get on their ponies and come after you, which is what happened. However, in this particular instance, uh, Coulter was a little bit hardier than uh, what they were counting on. He actually managed to get a lance away from one of the warriors uh, that was chasing him, and he killed a couple of them and got away. Um, got away and, and made his way back to, um, well, to uh, the, the states, to the, quote, civilized part of, of the country. I'm, I'm assuming at some point he must have uh, gotten something to use for clothing. But uh, that, was, uh, that was something that made him celebrated as a frontier figure. However, on his way, while he was making his way on foot uh, back uh, to the settlements, he passed through this one area uh, where um, the ground rumbled and all of a sudden giant geysers of steam came bursting up out of the ground. So naturally, like, like anybody would, John Coulter assumed he had found the entrance to hell. Uh, so when he did get back to the settlements, he said, oh, and by the way, I've been through hell to get here. Literally, the mouth of hell. Uh, and everyone kind of laughed at him. And it was a big joke for a long time that Coulter's hell is out there uh, somewhere. Ha ha. Uh, he must have, uh, you know, been out in the sun a little too long. And it was several decades later before other Americans made their way into that region that's known as the Yellowstone and discovered that, uh, well, geysers, you know, old faithful. Uh, it was a natural phenomenon. So uh, he wasn't crazy after all, turns out. So John Coulter is a good example of just how uh, hardy and tough someone had to be to survive as one of these uh, one of these mountain men. Oh, one more thing I want to mention about Sacagawea and the Lewis and Clark expedition. You know, I said that uh, they had wanted her along because she was Shoshone and they were getting ready to go through Shoshone territory and she spoke the language and knew the lay of the land. But one other thing that really made her a very valuable asset and not just in Shoshone territory was the fact that she was pregnant and had a small child. Why is that? Well, Think about it. We got 33 people. Well, 32 if you take out the one that uh, had the appendicitis attack. Um, two and a half, three dozen people wandering through the territory of these Native American tribes who have never encountered Americans before. Uh, not quite sure what they're up to. And this is several tribes' territory that they're going through. The fact that they had a woman and children with them actually opened a lot of doors because it immediately made it clear to the uh, other Indian groups that they were not a war party, that they were in fact on a peaceful mission because no one would go on a war party with uh, a young wife and little children along. So that, uh, that helped them out as well. All right, well, uh, Thomas Jefferson has successfully purchased this, uh, this territory, doubled the size of the United States. And there's a couple of different things that are now going to be open up to him. He wanted to continue expanding westward so that small farmers, so that just regular people could get access to land and have their own small farms. That was his vision for America. Now there's land to do that. He had also early on um, articulated the idea 
that as much as he admired the American Indian cultures and as much as he believed they were capable of, uh, of achieving greatness, he believed that they would be wiped out by the, their greedy white neighbors who wanted their land and that the safest and best thing would be to move them across the Mississippi River. Now, that was an idea that he had a couple of decades before uh, the Louisiana Purchase, and it was just an idea. It could never really be carried out because you can't just take a bunch of people and dump them on the other side of the Mississippi River when the other side of the Mississippi River belongs to a different country. But now, now there's lots of new land on the other side of the Mississippi, uh, land that is perhaps, much of it, not as desirable as agricultural land as the areas where these tribes, especially in the South, already were. So now there's a place to remove them to. <laughs> 